the second annual conference on teaching, learning, and research. Um, that was for you guys that are were here last year. That was the Pippa Palooza of last year. So that is held at the UCR Palm Desert Center on Saturday, August 26th. Um, they are requesting that all available residents and faculty participate in the event, if possible, as a judge. It's a great event. It's, um, I think it's mostly for the fourth year medical students who are presenting their LACE project QI, um, LACE program QI projects for the year. Um, so uh, it's a great event for you guys to put on your CVs and a great experience to be a judge for a research competition. So if you're interested, when I send out the announcements, um, you will contact Megan Duffer. <coughs> um, she's the one who's in charge of it. She can give you more information as to how to get set up and so that they know where to place you as a judge. So you can't, you know, you shouldn't be asking like a week before, I want to be a judge because they've already set aside who you are. And then even if you don't judge it and you just want to go, it's just a Saturday. I know Saturdays are precious, but this is a really great event, even if you can just stop by for a little bit. And also, if you can only judge for a certain amount of time, like from 8.30 to 11, they'll take it. So you just need to tell them that that's the time that you can judge. Um, or you can only judge, I think it's like 8.30 to 3.30 is the event. So if you can judge from like 12 to 3.30, then that would be okay too, just let her know when there's a and then for the third years, please decide on your electives again for the remainder of the year, especially for those who have um, electives scheduled in October, November, and December. I need to start working on um, clinic schedules, and I can't place you guys in clinic if you don't know what rotations you're going to be on during those months. And then for the second year, upcoming second years, um, you guys will be in the SNPs. So you get to do yeah. nursing home visit patients. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, um, I know you guys don't really know, it's really not that difficult. Um, and there is no really formal orientation process. What I would say is that what I think I'm going to do up until we get kind of get settled on our side, because there's been some hiccups, is that we haven't really been accepting a whole lot of patients. So as the current third years know, they haven't been more than three patients, which was originally the goal. They've been mostly at one or two. So what I'm going to do is grab the existing patients that we have now and double cover it between the second years um, and then the third years. What I'd like for you two to, to arrange when you buddy up with the third year on it, on an existing patient, is that you guys decide what part of the month you're going to see them. So that you're not both seeing them in the first week of the month. Spread it out so at least um, the patient gets seen throughout the month. So if one person's going to take the first part of the month, maybe the, the other resident will see them in the second or third week of the month. So you guys aren't buddying up and seeing them one day after another. All right. So those go at Premier and at California Nursing Home Rehab. Um, I'll leave it to your third years to kind of give you the details on them. They're close. California Rehab is probably less than five minutes away. Premier is maybe like 10 minutes away off Ramon, 10, 15 minutes away. And um, both are probably better as handwritten. Premier, you can do it as uh, electronic, but they really don't have any um, computers in the physician room unless you want to bring your laptop, log in, then they have to give you access and it's easier just to handwrite your note. Um, when you're seeing them on a monthly basis, it's just a progress note that you have to see them. So a soap note, you snap a picture, you send it to Sarah so that she can submit it for billing, okay? Um, if it's a brand new patient to the facility and you're picking them up, you have to do a HMP note and a progress note, so two separate notes during that visit. So you take a snapshot of both. The requirements are that you see your nursing home patients at least once a month, but if it's a needier patient who's a little bit more sick and requires more attention, then you should be seeing them more than once a month. That's just the minimum requirement, okay? If your patient's been there as a long-term custodial patient, really on cruise control, there are so many issues that arise, they live there, then once a month would be sufficient. So you gauge it based on the patient that you have. If it's a brand new patient to the facility, they need to be seen within 72 hours. So that means don't see them at the 72 hour mark because your attending physician also needs to see them within that 72 hours. So Try to see them within the first two days so that it gives you your attending some time to see them within that 72 hours. Both visits need to occur within the 72 hour time frame. Um, and other than that, I don't think there's any other restrictions to it. All right, so without further ado, we have Dr. Mallory Callender who's going to talk about non malignant thyroid diseases. Woo! 
some anatomy and physiology of the thyroid gland. We're going to review some common uh, pathological disease states of the thyroid, including their presentations, how they're diagnosed, how they're managed. Um, I outlined some special populations and how these diseases affect them. Um, and we also reinforce some concepts by participating in some multiple prep sessioning. Have a little fun. Uh, if there's any questions at any point during the presentation, please don't ask. I have to party. So, so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, first we'll start with some anatomy. So the thyroid gland uh, sits in the anterior part of the neck. Uh, it slightly hugs the trachea. Um, the normal thyroid uh, dull gland is about 10 to 20 grams. Its blood supply comes from the bilateral superior and inferior thyroid artery, as well as the thyroid IMA, which is um, a, a remnant. It may or may not be present. It's, I think, the embryonic artery. Uh, when it doesn't regress, that's what it turns into. Um, its claim to fame is that it houses or it produces thyroid hormones, your T4, which is the most uh, abundant, and your T3, which is actually the active one and the more potent one, made by the follicular cells of the, the gland, and is regulated by thyroid stimulating hormone um, for our medicines, whereas thyroid stimulating hormone uh, produced. produced in the Anterior pituitary gland. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the gland's main function is really um, regulating the met uh, metabolic activities of the uh, of the body, and it is absolutely dependent on iron source. Um, so this diagram really just shows this doesn't have a thing in it. So this is a um, normal thyroid gland, and as you can see on the right side of it, the tissue is a little bit <coughs> bigger. Um, that's considered what's called a goiter. And this is just several states of goiter that you may see as patients present in the office, uh, ranging from mild to severe. All right, uh, important, the physical exam. Uh, it's important to do it and do it correctly. So um, three important steps, you inspect, you palpate, and you auscultate. So you want to position the patient so that the neck is extended and you're able to um, visualize the anterior surface so you can assess for asymmetry. Um, it would be great if you have some water or something uh, present to have them participate in this uh, um, a little easier by asking them to swallow and you observe any movements that the thyroid has or any movements in that anterior part of the neck. Then uh, letting them know what you're doing, you go, go from behind, and again, you're accessing the, the nodules, any tenderness, any asymmetry, you're checking for texture and size. Um, you ask them to swallow again, and you notice any movements um, as it uh, passes along your fingertips. And lastly, you auscultate to identify the presence of any breweries, which would be increased in um, any blood flow um, uh, to the organ or to the gland. All right, so lab findings. So I thought this was a pretty cool chart. It outlines various thyroid diseases and their associated lab finding. Um, since this lecture is not all inclusive, um, I will only highlight a few, and they are strategically bolded. So, um, but before I even talk about the, um, the disease states, it's good to just start with the normal. So if there's a normal non-pathologic thyroid state, your TSH should be normal and your thyroid hormones should be normal. You have no disease. And of course, now hyperthyroidism, you have uh, an increase or excess in thyroid hormones. So your T4 and T3 are gonna be high and consequently your TSH is gonna be low. Um, and then you look at hypothyroidism, primary hypothyroidism, now your free T3 and three, four, free T4 and T3 are now low, and as a result of the, um, the hormonal access, access feedback, you're going to have increase in your TSH to try to rev up um, the gland to produce those hormones. And you guys can look at the other one, uh, the, the slides are provided, so you can take a look at the others. Pop quiz number one. Uh, Two 
most common causes of hyperthyroidism? Or to take a crack at it. Autoimmune. Autoimmune, namely, Hashimoto's. That's one. You gotta give me two cents to start it. Uh, yeah. What was it? Sort of, kind of. Yeah, so it's actually um, when you overtreat uh, hyperthyroidism, you can make the patient hyperthyroid. So I guess if you're surgically removing some of the thyroid, that would kind of count. So managing hypothyroidism. Um, so this, this chart, I really liked it. Um, I think I saw all of the same dosage everywhere that I looked. So in a non-pregnant patient, you, you're treating with legal, first of all, um, and you can do 1.6 mics per kilogram per day as a dosage. Uh, another important population is pregnant patients. Pregnant patients because they they require. I don't know how do you doctor speak. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment on that 1.6 microgram per kick. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I hear this from residents just because I preset they'll say, well, "Should we start 25 micrograms or 50 micrograms?" That might be appropriate as a note here for the older patients, but for your average kind of young person or middle-aged person. It's okay to apply this rule, which usually ends up to being around 100 micrograms to 125 micrograms as the starting dose. So that's the appropriate treatment, just something to think about. I think you titrate up by like 12.5 to 25. Slowly. Over, yeah. I just um, want to throw that out there. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, the pregnant patients, because pregnancy requires so much more, uh, it's such a, um, uh, a higher state of metabolism that's happening, you need to increase the dosage of your, your liver of these patients. So what's recommended is that you add on two doses. So they're taking it um, once a day. So on two different days, they're going to increase their dose. Is that how you guys practice? Do you, do you refer out for our pregnant thyroid? You don't have to refer out to endocrinologists. Just increase the you, dose, you do? yeah. Okay. Um, and then patients with subclinical you look at how you measure the TSH, and based on what the TSH level is, you can start at the 50 mics um, daily, or and then increase by 25 over uh, six weeks until the TSH is within this range, 0. 0.35 to 5.5 uh, milli. That's milli international units uh, per liter. Just because there are some times that you might not feel comfortable, these are some some instances where it would be uh, justifiable to refer out. Uh, us as primary um, uh, physicians here. If the patients are younger than 18, if they have uh, comorbid, uh, comorbid um, uh, cardiac disease, if they have other endocrine diseases, if they are pregnant and you're just not comfortable with it, or if they're truly unresponsive to therapy that you've been doing um, for months on it. So uh, this was a, just a quick um, uh, slide showing one of the big complications of uh, hypothyroidism, myxedema coma. It's actually an exacerbation of hypothyroidism. You have a decrease, a severely decreased metabolic state and altered mental status. Patients present with stupor, they hypoventilate, they have low blood pressure, their heart rate is slow, and of course, your treatment, you want to get um, the thyroid woman in as quick as possible, so you're doing an IV. And this definitely presents with high mortality. Right, so special populations to consider regarding hypothyroidism is, of course, our newborns. So congenital hypothyroidism, it's found in about one in every 35, um, 35 to 3,500 to 4,000 births. It's the most uh, treatable cause of mental retard retardation. It's inversely uh, proportionate as far as the age of diagnosis to intelligent quotient later in life. And the majority of cases are sporadic. Um, the majority of cases are sporadic developmental defects of the thyroid gland. Um, such as a rest migration of the embryonic thyroid uh, or complete absence of the thyroid tissue. In a minority of cases, it's actually due to thyroid dyshormonogenesis um, caused by uh, autorecessive uh, mode of inheritance. Can I comment? Sure, yeah. Um, on the nutrition. One, 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 one way to phrase this um, is that it's uh, the most preventable cause of mental retardation because if it's not treated okay. early, you can't treat a patient with okay. mental retardation and reverse disease. And in that spirit, this is part of the California newborn screen, and it's one of the two most common things we find in the California newborn screen. It's the most common thing we need to treat immediately. Um, and so it's worthwhile having a little pocket card of how to treat you know, hypothyroidism before we need to have weekend call, we need to initiate treatment. It's almost like you were planted here. Thanks. <laughs> Specifically, unlike the other, unlike unlike a, unlike how we typically measure you know, screen for hypothyroidism, the newborn screen looks before. As opposed to TSH. 
specific. So many take your care. We don't have to manage it. So I may have given it accidentally, but um, in, in a patient that you suspect that has symptoms of hypothyroidism, the first thing you want to do is you want to, of course, do the physical exam and uh, laboratory testing, you would look for a TS, uh, TSH. You can also add on the free T4, but you definitely should start with the TSH. So if your TSH is high, I don't think it's necessary that you need to do a, a TSH, but if it's low or low normal, then you grab a, a free T4. And we start, yeah. start patients on thyroid supplementation. How do you counsel your patients to take the medication? Mm -hmm. If they get any time during the day, just taking the regular medication. <laughs> I have to clean up. Take care of the water. Oh, you're already happy. Funny because we have your precept and we have all the rest of the So you should take it on an empty stomach for at least two hours before you can. You say one hour, I usually try to take it two hours. So we have to be careful because when you get that difficult to control, a lot of times they haven't been counseled on how to take medication. So they're taking in the morning with their breakfast, they're taking in the morning with their vitamins, they find the calcium. So, um, you know, I've had some patients where I was like, so when do you take it? Oh, I take it before I eat. And I said, so how long do you wait before you eat? Oh, I eat right after I take it. So you <laughs> eat for breakfast, a bowl of cereal every morning. <laughs> so yeah. It's things like that that you want to be careful. And then a multivitamin will have calcium in it too. So you want to make sure that you take it on an empty stomach without the other medication. Because you never know what's coating the medication or anything like that. So, um, if they can't take it first thing in the morning, um, one option is, is that I ask them to maybe set an alarm like two hours before you're going to wake up and just keep it by the bedside with some water and take it. Or they can take it at night if they eat early enough where they're not anything by mouth other than water for two hours before they go to bed. And that's another option you can do too. And some people are like, oh, I can't afford to wake up two hours early. Yeah, I do apologize. I think I backspace and I deleted a few slides mm -hmm. in this, this set that I sent to Sarah. But, uh, huh? <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> My commentary. <laughs> uh, so Stephanie, pop to number two. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not hypothyroid. I'm not going to mess with you. It is hypothyroid. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, kind of what Dr. Kim was talking about. If you have a patient that uh, you've been treating for hypothyroidism, they've been doing well, they're adhering to their medications, and they're coming back and their TSH is a little wacky. You know, what, what are some things that you can give them? Um, so, it could be that they're taking it with food or they're taking it too close to eating or drinking milk with it or, or um, something that has calcium because that binds and um, decreases the avail availability of that thyroid hormone. Or it could be a non compliant patient who has not taken their medication. Uh, it could also be the patient is now pregnant, and so now the pregnant patients need to have more uh, T4 or more thyroid hormone. And so it could be that's the possibility, or they're also taking oral contraceptives, which cause also decreases the um, bioavailability of um, the, the thyroid hormone. All right, so our second disease state hyperthyroidism. So, what is it? It's an excess concentration of thyroid hormones caused by either increase in synthesis, excess, excessive release um, of preformed hormones, or ex exogenous and endogenous uh, extra thyroid um, source. So overall prevalence is about 1.2%. This came from I think the National um, Health and Nutrition Survey. It was done in like 13,000 people from 1998 to 1994. I hadn't really found any other 
um, statistics that were more up to date. But overt hypothyroidism um, accounts for about 0.5% and subclinical 0.7%. So not that high, and definitely less than um, hypothyroidism, which slide was also deleted. I promise they were there. Uh, so common swelling of uh, untreated hypothyroidism, you can see hypertension, heart failure, um, cardiac uh, arrhythmias like AFib, uh, bone, um, bone loss, and thyroid storm. So as far as um, causes of hypothyroidism, uh, Graves' disease definitely is the more common uh, cause. It's an autoimmune disorder um, that in which the thyroid stimulating antibodies, um, they stimulate the thyroid uh, stimulating receptor. And so there, it triggers increase of this, uh, their thyroid hormones. Then you have, um, yeah, you have toxic uh, multinodular border. Um, this one is the, the second most common cause of hypothyroidism in the U.S. and it's the most common cause of hypothyroidism in elderly patients in iodine insufficient areas. And I thought that that was worth noting. Um, and then painless or transient, um, this is a destruction of the thyroid follicles. It's also via uh, autoimmune, um, similar to Graves, but uh, similar, but not quite. Audio, the, uh, the Graves is against the it stimulates the thyroid receptor. I think the transient or the, the painless one, I don't think it's actually uh, identified exactly what uh, or how the autoimmune destruction is, um, what causes it. And these are some less common causes. Uh, Drug-induced you know, amiodarone causes uh, some issues. That's why you always check your PFTs, TFTs, LFTs, and TFTs. So, um, these are other some, some of the less common causes that I didn't plan to really go through, but they're here in case you want to take a look at them. <clears throat> so signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Um, so just based on broad categories, um, and some of them you would see some overlap in other sections. So adenergic responses, you will have your, your palpitations, your tachycardia, your um, jitteriness, your tremor, diaphoresis. Uh, cardiovascular, you have your AFib uh, or the uh, cardiac arrhythmias that I mentioned. Um, and the cutaneous manifestation, plumber nails or anicolysis, um, which are patchy or generalized hyperpigmentation, hyper patchy or generalized hyperpigmentation of the face and neck is another um, finding. And as far as Greg's disease, you have that pretibial uh, myxedema that is um, that you always, I think it's usually in the, the stem of questions or it's suggested in stem of questions for exams. Um, and some of these other ones, I actually don't think I've noted, like the thyroid acropathy. I don't think I've ever noticed that in a patient. Um, uh, Hypermetabolism, so they, they, they lose weight in spite of their increased appetite. Um, Neuromuscular-wise, they have brief peripheral uh, reflexes, but their actual, the peripheral muscles are actually weakened. Um, and ocular findings, especially with brain disease, you have that exophthalmos. Um, Perioral um, edema and you can have diplopia of blood vision and reduced color uh, perception. So, how hyperthyroidism is diagnosed? So, a patient presents with uh, signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Um, you, you, uh, you obtain lab results, you have a TSH that's low, and you have um, T4 and T3 that are either elevated or normal. The next step that you want to do you want to do your radioactive iodine uptake scan of the thyroid. If you have a low uptake, that far left branch, then you consider thyroiditis, exogenous thyroid hormone, or ectopic thyroid hormone. If you have increased uptake, then you're looking at whether it's a homogeneous distribution or if it's like it's if it's speckled within the the um, the, the gland. So if it's homogeneous, then you're automatically thinking grapes. So high uptake, homogeneous, you have grapes. If you notice that it's more nodular and in different areas, if it's just one point area, of course, that would be the toxic adenoma of plumber disease. And if it's in multiple areas, then that's your toxic multinodular border. So here again, we're talking about the radioactive iodine uptake scan. Um, this definitely helps you, like I said, differentiate between the different causes. So with very disease, you're gonna, it's gonna be smooth, it's gonna be heterogeneous, it's gonna be high uptake. And um, I'm kind of just repeating what I said before, the, the multinodular one, you're gonna see the high uptake, but it's gonna be in patches. Um, and the toxic adenoma is just gonna be a central a high uptake, but in just one defined uh, portion of the, the, the thyroid gland. So how do you manage uh, this disease? It depends on the cause of the hyperthyroidism. So for Graves' disease, 
you have three treatment choices, uh, antithyroid medication like metamazole or um, PTU, you can do a radioactive iodine ablation or surgical uh, thyroidectomy. So the choice really is gonna depend on weighing the risk and benefits in that specific situation. And of course the patient's benefit. If you don't wanna do surgery, then you're not gonna offer them surgical um, thyroidectomy. Uh, for the painless or subacute thyroiditis, uh, these uh, conditions are still self-limiting. I should resolve within six months. You manage the symptoms, so the beta blocker and the NSAIDs or aspirin, you can use to do that. Um, and uh, there's no, really no role for antithyroid medications or ablation because, like I said, it's self-limiting. It's really just uh, conservative, conservative and managing their symptoms. Uh, the toxic adenoma or the multinodular goiter. Here you have the radio iodine ablation and the thyroidectomy. So, so fairly similar to um, Graves' disease, except you don't have the, the antithyroid medications. So if you actually do have a patient with a multinodular gorda and it's actually causing um, mass effect, then you would consider the thyroidectomy over the radio iodine ablation. This kind of says some of what the drugs do. Um, that's what so uh, this really just summarizes hyperthyroidism. You know, patients will come to you, they're gonna report, or they may report heat intolerance. They're gonna probably talk about the palpitations or they'll notice that they've had them. Uh, they have the weight loss regardless of their eating habits, um, tachycardia and anxiety. The exam you'll probably have, um, you'll probably, if you do a, a re, uh, re, use your reflex hammer, you'll see the hyperreflexia. Uh, your lab values will show that low TSH on your high um, thyroid hormones. And uh, your treatment would be either methimazole or PTU. Um, and of course, if your patient is pregnant, you want to use uh, PTU because methimazole is teratogenic. Then you can use it after the third, around the third trimester, if necessary, but definitely not in the first, first and um, second. <coughs> so special populations to consider again with um, with hyperthyroidism. So the incidence uh, of what hyperthyroidism is 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 rarely um, seen. Um, it occurs in 0.1 uh, to 0.4% of all pregnancies. Um, some complications that arise from uh, hyperthyroidism in pregnancy, though, are spontaneous abortions, preterm uh, pre labor, low birth weight, still, still birth, preeclampsia, and heart failure. I want to give a crack at this one. Fingers that for pop quiz number three. Anybody? Three channels. Say that again? Three channels. Not quite. Every four weeks. Yes. For um, all the patients with hyperthyroidism, like really diagnosed, you always get a radioactive right diagnosis. Yeah. Or of the patients with which one? Like newly diagnosed. Like let's say you have them in the clinic with this time. You're like, oh, this is the You have the two the uptake too. Um, I, is it every month or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because kind of you have no other way of differentiating. Like, yeah, so that's, that's where the pregnancy cause, because it looks at, the scan looks at the, the distribution of the uptake, so you can kind of try which which disease you're looking at. So, so that's 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 <laughs> uh, so for newborns, so these little kiddos are twins that um, that unfortunately demonstrate some features of neonatal hyperthyroidism, including some anxious appearing stares and uh, diminished subcutaneous fat. But you also notice that um, newborns are, are uh, congenital hyperthyroidism can cause IUGR, um, microcephaly. You know, all these different things, so it's not of uh, any small consequence when patient or kiddos are, are born with neonatal um, hyperthyroidism. I actually did want to just go back because I kind of sort of remember this one of the slides for hypothyroidism. Um, as far as you don't see in pregnancy, as far as the, the special population, you don't necessarily see it a lot in pregnancy because most women who are hypothyroid are anabolic, so their chances of becoming pregnant are lower, as well as um, they tend to, inc there's an increased risk in uh, first trimester abortion, um, spontaneous abortion, so they don't necessarily carry out a full pregnancy. So that's, so I, still, I do have slides. <laughs> 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 All 
so just a more some question. Anybody can uh, to read this one? 45 year old man presents with irritability and insomnia. Initial testing reveals a thyroid stimulating hormone level of 0.1 MIUs per liter. Free thyroxine and triiodothyronine levels are normal, and a radioactive iodine thyroid scan demonstrates increased uptake with diffuse tracer distribution. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A, Graves' disease, B, toxic multinodular goiter, C, subacute thyroiditis, D, exo exogenous hyperthyroidism. You can phone a friend. Open to anyone who wants to share it out. To think about the scan. Mm -hmm. So, are we going to go back? It could be. What kind of hormone? We got another cue. Be confident. It's either that or be. I'm There we go. So, the big thing is the tracer. Uh, the question they asked about the tracer is going to be what helps you uh, delineate what disease you're talking about in hyperthyroidism. So, I did throw you off by having the normal thyroid hormone. It can be um, low or normal. So, would you treat this patient or with the normal? Yes. Yes, start, yes, yes or no and why? Yes, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a yes or no question. <laughs> yes. Yes, because yeah. they are symptomatic. Yeah. So it's subacute yes. hyperthyroidism because the levels are normal, but it's symptomatic subacute right. hyperthyroidism. So therefore, you still treat. Them. And if they didn't have symptoms, if they were a cardiac patient, you would still treat them because that's going to cause. Worsening of the cardiac status. Six weeks ago, he was driving a legal car accident in the car race. He had not been taking her medication. She has been taking her medication as instructed, and her symptoms improved. But the best thing, be testing of her thyroid scanner, which shows that it is still elevated, which the form is the next best step in management. The change of medication to the thyroid hormone, then T3. Decrease the dose of the equivalents and maybe the TSH testing. It's like UK testing, that's not good. Increase dose of the equivalents and decrease TSH testing in six weeks, making it hurt this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I definitely agree with repeating the TSH testing at six weeks. Uh, well, educate. You want to make sure, kind of like what you said, that they're taking their medication before they eat on an empty stomach and not with like milk or um, any calcium containing products. <laughs> One of our, our new interns. <laughs> you just have to read. We'll help you answer. Yeah. A 32 year old woman with a history of Graves' disease presents to your office with a question about her medication. She just found out she's pregnant and wants to know if any changes need to be made to her treatment regimen during her pregnancy. Which of the most appropriate <laughs> therapy? A carbamazole, mm -hmm. thyroxine, C metrolisethamazole. Yeah. Okay. Wait, it's 
choices do you do first though? IV fluids? I think it is. It's, it's the airway stuff. Um, so when you have mixed edema like this, you actually want to give them steroid stress doses first before you give them the loading dose of thyroid because you're not going to get action of the thyroid hormone until you get the, until you fix these, um, their cortic uh, corticosteroid state. So you actually want to give them B first, but the definitive treatment is C. Mm -hmm. Screw you over on board with stupid questions like that. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you know the right answer, but they're going to ask it to you in a way that they want to. You know the right answer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So you can do like 50 IV results, 100 IV results. <laughs> you can give it like an hour. Once, once, because it's it's going to get into your system quickly, and then once it's aged, then you can start the whole thyroid hormone. You need to give it some more first. <laughs> Oh, 
Great, it's more appropriate for her because it's her job. It's yeah. in my email, I guess, go to HR. Yeah. <laughs>